welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Beth Piles. Today's guest is Winky Day, a former dragon boat racer and now a coach of Blind Paradragon Boat Racing Team. Today we're going to discuss dragon boat racing, paddling the way. Welcome, Winky. Thank you. Um, this is Winky. How are how are you today? We're doing great. We're doing great. I'm really excited to share with our guests a little bit more about dragon boat racing. And you have quite a bit of an experience in this sport. Tell me a little bit about dragon boat racing and your experience as both a paddler and a coach. Okay, um, I began dragon boating after being introduced uh, at a festival um, event through my work, uh, part of the diversity programs. And it only took one race and I was hooked. It's part of a bit by the dragon, what we call, or I get addicted to paddling. It's the either the adrenaline or it affected your neurological system to the point where you just can't stop. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what dragon boat racing is? Okay. Dragon boat racing actually can be back to um, over 2,000 years ago. It was originated in China, and the Chinese politician or poet had taken his own life. And there's a legend where the fishermen in the area um, quickly ran to the to the shore and began splat, um, beating drums and splashing their paddles on the water to to, to stop the the um, fish and the and the evil spirits from consuming his body. Um, they didn't want their beloved um, politician to be be um, eaten by the fish. And they continued the sport in honor of him. And every festival, they they dot they do an eye dotting ceremony in his honor. Now it is a race, and it is um, sprint racing, and where you they the Chinese at every a lunar year they 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 do this and and race um, all the teams. It gets the uh, it's, it's a team building experience. It can be historically thought of for agricultural purposes where you could get uh, teams together and, and then they would um, do the planting season for, for the uh, rice. And that could also now be used as corporate um, incentives for, for businesses to build their teams to get programs done. So it's interesting, a lot of history that's kind of been revived into more of a modern day type of sport. That is very interesting indeed. Yes. They, so they, it's, it's very, very interesting to be part of it. So you specifically coach a blind or visually impaired uh, group of athletes who do the paradragon boat racing. Are there any athletes that are in the boat that are sighted? They have different level or different uh, variations of of the team teamwork or framework for the Paradragon division. Um, they have what they call a PD one, which in which would be Paradragon one is all of the members are are in some way impaired. Now they don't have to have the same impairment. It's it can be anything from hearing loss or eyesight loss or um, a finger even, or even PTSD, neurological problems. And then there is a PD2 division, and that describes where you have mixed, um, mixed um, unimpaired and impaired paddlers. And it's usually 10 and 10 in a standard boat. If it's a, a small boat, it would be then five and five. And then there is the PD3, which would be all the same impairment. 
And so that's really the, the key difference between paradragon and dragon boat racing is the level of the, the kind of the point system and the combination of, of impairments that are occupying a particular boat. Um, the communication is really important during races. So talk to me about how do you communicate, particularly it's got to have a lot of wind and noise. You have a, a drum beat to kind of keep the boat moving. And I'm sure there's a lot of shouting going on during these races. So talk to me about communication and how you are effective at communicating with people for both performance and for safety purposes. Well, it, it, in the beginning, when, when we begin training these folks or, or new, what we call newbies, <laughs> um, you, you have to, I, I deal with just strictly the, the blind paddlers, um, but we try to get them to do the same thing at the same time. And to do that, we have to introduce them to the paddle, how they feel. They have to, to feel it. And, and, um, and you have to explain the different parts of the paddle so that they understand that. And, and then you have to put them in, in the boat and explain their seating arrangement, um, that they have a sided, sided steerer and a sided drummer and that they give the commands for them to to um, participate in the in the race. Um, we also train many 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 times before we take them out on the, on into a race because they have to know the calls for um, movement. In in any kind of a racing situation, you have different um, sections that you use in a race. Like we have start. And and then we have the body of the race, and then we have a finish, and they they get to learn all of those. It takes several several years to develop a, a very um, a premier level paddler, which we have successfully done with a, a few of our members. But um, every year you get a changeover because new people come in, so it's right, exciting. which probably makes it. And it probably makes it a little challenging when you have new people coming in and you're teaching them the sports. Maybe, maybe some like you've gotten involved in the sport later in life. And you, that communication piece is, is really critical. You mentioned doing a lot of training beforehand, before they compete. But even during training sessions, are there other boats on the water that you're looking out for that may sort of complicate the training session a little bit? I'm imagining it's not a closed course, correct? No, no. You have boat wake, um, you have wind, you, you have challenges with the with the um, swells, and you have to explain to them, or they can even feel it. They, they, I mean, they can feel a lot, especially the more more often that they're out there, they, they understand what's happening. Um, but it's just to know that they're in a boat, first of all, they're, where they have to have their feet planted and how they uh, angle their blade into the water, um, how to get to their hands wet, you know, knowing where the, the blade and where the, um, the, the spoon or the bill of the blade ends and where the shaft begins and, and how they hold their hands at different sections of the, of the um, training. Um, I usually we usually go through uh, the catch, and then we give them the the um, pull position. Pull positions. We run them through all of those and the exits because if they don't exit at the right time, then they're going to throw the the entire boat off. So it's mm -hmm. it's um, very tactile. Are there different strategies when you're coaching a team with such a wide emotional and physical spectrum ranging between the ages of 12 and 80? I'm assuming there's got to be some challenges in there. Always. Um, you tend to be less, less focused as the elder, elder folks, but um, even, even um, getting them to, to, it's just more of a repetitive motion that you have to drill in. It's a lot of drills. But they'll they'll catch on, and the more they do it, they they grow into it. Are there any specific challenges or techniques associated when steering the actual dragon boat itself? Steering it, oh, there's mm -hmm. challenges when when you have other boats um, ne next to you, or or um, if they they're coming towards you, you have to avoid them. 
but then you don't want to be out of your lane. So you have to stay in your lane. Sorry, in 2011, there were two dragon boats that capsized during a race. And after they were trying to rescue the racers from the water, the police boat also capsized due to all of the panicking racers trying to climb aboard at once. What are some safety measures that are in place to protect the athletes in case any accidents or capsizing happens? Well, actually, all of the all of the paddlers must wear PFDs, especially when it comes to to the um, impaired. And PFDs, you're talking about personal flotation devices, the the life jackets that they yeah. have to wear is part of the safety measures. It's a safety measure, yes. Personal flotation devices are required at any festival. Um, it's just what happens is if somebody panics. Um, usually there's other boat chase boats that come along, but we teach them to stay with the boat. These boats will stay afloat and the, and the whole, and we tell them they are to stay with the boat and not to and wait for the, re, the crew to, to rescue, pull them out. We actually do um, some training within um, local pools where we get them, especially when people don't know how to to swim or never been in water even some of them so we get them accustomed to floating in a pfd first of all and then we have where we have um people on the side of the side to pull them out by their pfd so they understand um how to react and we do a lot of where they they stay they huddle together so that they don't get float away they stay with the boat so that they can be rescued properly. That's pretty incredible that someone who may not be comfortable in the water or even know how to swim is willing to get on a boat, particularly if they're visually impaired, or or does that make it easier if, if, if they have an impairment, maybe uh, are they less frightened of the water at that, that point? What has been your experience of people who don't have a strong swimming background becoming a paddler? They usually we don't have that many cap sizes or, or problems with with um, the in these races because of the professionalism there is involved. Um, of course, there there will be accidents, especially if there's there's weather related incident um, problems that happen, like current change. Um, it, you can you can start out at flat in the morning, and then in the afternoon you've got swells. So. Um, and learn, letting them know to don't stop paddling is one of the keys is because that's when you become unstable. Um, but if you keep, everybody keeps their weight to their side of the boat, it should stay out and they can put place their paddles in, in such a way that, that it will ballast the boat. We call it brace the boat. They put their blades flat on top of the water. It, there's a lot of terms that they have to learn and how to hold their paddles. They need to know how to, to draw or like to pull the boat one way or help out. If you, if somebody slipped, uh, if your steers slipped out, at least you'd have somebody giving you a call how to get them to, to maneuver the boat to a, to a shoreline or someplace where they, that they could be, um, uh, get someone else to help them imagine you probably have to consider weight on each side of the boat. Is that part of a factor in, in how you strategize organizing the athletes and arranging them on the boat? Yes, we do. We do have to. We must. That's part of the safety also is, is having the right ballast in the boat. And we have certain sections that we, <clears throat> we can't, we um, have to put, put the weight adjustments for, for the strongest paddlers and some of the um, uh, lighter weight people that so that it just keeps it even on both sides and front to back. But when you're practicing, do the athletes move around a different position? Do you, do you kind of try to audition them in different places and get them some experience? They, they get auditioned throughout the season. <laughs> it's, it's more, um, we don't usually... In, Actually, in a smaller boat, you want the weight up front. Um, 
because there's more of a bow and and more of a standard boat you would probably you would um want it more towards more weight towards the center and um or the back of the boat slightly it's it's just um there's cer- certain degrees and we have we have a, a calculator that we use to um adjust for that so there's math involved. I'm hearing you say you have to do some math as part of your coaching expertise. Always. I said, I, I get angry sometimes because when we set up a, a practice I've and they've signed up to, to come out, I know what their weights are, or general ideas, and I put them in a seat. And if they don't, if they don't show up, I have mm-hmm. to rearrange the, uh, the boat to, to accommodate it. <laughs> quite literally the balancing act of, of everything there. And let's talk about that a little bit. When people are, they, they sign up to come and, and to train, but these are volunteers, right? They're doing it because they enjoy it. And so you sort of have to be flexible and go with the flow as far as their schedules. How, how does that factor into how you're able to train and, and prepare yourself adequately for competition? Well, it's a it's a balancing act. We yeah, we have to um, be be uh, fluid because you have to to get them out on the water and make sure that they understand what they need to do and and do their work. Um, we we often they ha- often had problems in earlier years because of transportation wasn't as easy as it is now. Now they have lift and and you have cell phones. Whereas before it wasn't always like that. We had to use phone trees to make sure everybody was coming and calling them and, and scheduling it. Um, now it's it's done through apps where we have them sign up and, and if they can notify us by a certain time, we can either um, take, um, rearrange the lineup or or give give um, cancel out the whole whole practice because we don't have enough people to come even out so we have to have at least um eight people i think in a standard boat to take one out um and probably at least um four or five no six in the stand in the smaller boat because it's it's easier it's more more uh tendency to be a little more Tippy, I should, which should say, than yeah. a standard boat. Yeah, and you would need your drummer and your steer, so those would be kind of critical. <laughs> yeah, we always, I mean, we always have those set. Set those are set. Those are our sighted people. Those are our volunteers, and um, we we schedule it for the same, usually the same day of the week or night, evenings. We do evenings and and weekends usually, even on Saturdays and Sundays, and and at least one day during the week. So paddle boats are pretty large. How do you go about getting your boat to and from practices and races? Well, um, well, most um, festivals, promoters, they have the boats there available for you. So you don't have to take the boats, but we do take the equipment. Um, uh, Some of us, some of our paddlers have their own paddles. Um, they've they've gotten accustomed to using different carbon fiber um, versus the old style, old wooden type. Uh, they also have we have their own some of them buy their own p- um, personal flotation devices because at these festivals you've got all of these clip-ons that aren't really the just the right size for you. So they they go out and get their own. You can um, use gl- paddling gloves. That helps um, to to uh, avoid getting blisters or calluses if you paddle a lot. And they they um they get we uh, arrange to uh, either carpool some of our folks, or at times we have to rent a bus to go someplace, and or arrange airfare, which quite, requires quite a bit of planning. Yeah. Even the transportation of those athletes to, to practice can be challenging. If they're, they're visually impaired, they won't be able to 
drive themselves to practice. So is transportation to and from training an issue? They, um, currently, just having, um, like I said, they use public transportation. We have to have a site that, that's pretty much um, accessible to a, a um, subway system or they, they have metropolitan uh, bus services that takes them to to a particular location. And then we have volunteers that um, go pick them up. Um, currently, a lot of them have been coming more self-sufficient and can find know how to count their steps or, or um, where to turn, where they're located so that they can get down to where we're located, to our um, paddling dock. That's great. Um, but, um, how do you do you ever have issues with the weather? Like how do the weather conditions affect the safety of your races and your practices? Do you guys have a special way of monitoring that? Well, if it rains, you're going to get wet. <laughs> as long <laughs> as there's not um, lightning and thunder. Now, if, if there's any thunder or lightning while we're, pra um, it, it becomes like that. We have to get off the water immediately. And we usually will wait until it, you have to wait at least a half an hour. Um, between um, thunder, thunder or lightning, that you have to wait until you you can get back out on the water. But we don't like to miss we don't like to miss many many practices. Yeah. Do you guys have a special uh, service that you use to monitor the weather, or like for big races and things? Are there specific people there in case of any type of bad weather? They, they they monitor the radar systems coming across the um, internet. Uh, they use NOAA a lot of times and the marine forecast forecast with radar. Um, you have to be careful. Have to watch the tide sometimes. Um, if it gets too high, you can't take them out because or there's a lot of current or something like that. We don't. It, it makes it difficult to steer. So we. Unless we have an a established crew, you don't want to take newbies out in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So we um we have it set up we are in our app that if you sign up and there's there's a bad storm coming, like the, the last week there was a tornado warning, so we had to cancel or postpone it for the next night. Mm. And so um we let them know at least um. <clears throat> By by an hour or two before the the practice begins, because some of them have to start out an hour or two beforehand, so we have to let them know in advance. Yeah, and that might be sufficient for for like a training exercise. But what about in a competition where people have to be there early, get on the water early, maybe be staged and ready to go? I would imagine it would be pretty complicated to call everybody back in off the water. What are the protocols if weather kind of comes up and is unexpectedly disrupts the, the competition? It, it is still the, the half hour rule that they go with, um, but they do. Um, in nationals, we were in Tampa, which is the lightning capital of the world, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, they they took that they would call you off the wall if they they know I mean they they're really um hooked into the to the um the the um weather systems that come across there so they know if it's coming and that they'll stop the the races and then hold it until they know that it's clear because a lot of those those storms blow through and they're they don't stay there but it it depends on it varies from area to area and it's just a um club ruling or a, or like I said, the festival, um, festival promoters, they have to make these decisions. Mm. Um, a lot of times they'll, they'll take, if it is a race and, and they have to cancel after the <clears throat> second heat, they'll take an average out what everybody's times were and, and, and award the winners from those, their, their, their first couple heats. So it's not always cut and dry, but it's the best, you know, if they know that they have a timeline, they can't continue on the next day or something like that. Absolutely. Uh, so Winky, I'm curious, this sport has a long history behind it, 
but I'm curious what you see as the future for dragon boat racing, para dragon racing. What, uh, what do you see for the future? Any kind of emerging trends or developments in the sport that we should be aware of? Well, they have, um, they have considered, they have their own, um, championship races and then they have world championship races. Um, and it, it really depends on if they did want to continue to, to, um, try to bring groups, larger groups, like having a standard boat versus a small boat or having two clubs, having a boat team or team members on both a, a standard and a, a small boat rather than just go to like a 12 man boat instead of trying to do 20 and or a t both 20 and a 10 man um, boat. So I, if anything, I think that they will probably um, make a, 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 a specific size and go with that if it gets really big. Um, fortunately, it's not, I mean, it's all over the world, but I don't think that um, everybody's ready to give up, you know, their, their specialty. <laughs> some people do better in small boats and some people do better sure. in, in the large boat. Sure. Larger so maybe some efficiency or common ground. And I imagine that'd be uh, easier to coordinate in the long run. Well, Winky, thank you so much for your insight into dragon boat racing, paddling the way. We thank you for your time today. Well, you're most welcome. And uh, I wish I said, I wish I had a specific answer for everything, but it get I mean, it's, it's kind of um, where you, it, it's constantly changing um, and, and your team changes because your, your, your ages and, and, and uh, backgrounds come at, come into effect. Um, we have become a more competitive team, whereas we started out just as festival teams in our club. So. Really it makes nice. it for an interesting sport when there is a lot of diversity of people participating. So mm -hmm. thank you for your time. And, and thanks to my co-host, Beth Piles, today. Thanks for being here. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. We will see you next time on The Sports Playbook. Mm -hmm.